Honorable Suleiman Dabo. Today, we are honored to have the Honorable Member for Serekunda, Honorable Halifa Sala, as our guest in the program um, today. Um, Honorable Halifa Sala, welcome to wel or welcome back to Mamos Media. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be very here. good. Um, so, normally the program is about uh, um, ideas, policies uh, for from political leaders about what they intend to do. Um, should they win elections um, in the year 2021? But obviously, before we get to elections, we must have laws that guide those elections. Um, so uh, the Constitutional Review Commission submitted its report to the president. The president, as an executive, um, presented that as a bill to the National Assembly uh, for you guys to vote on to, to move to the last phase of that process, um, to, to, which is the referendum um, to be conducted for if the government peoples agree, then it becomes the constitution of the land. Fortunately, um, that did not happen because most members in the National Assembly voted against the bill. Um, so that would be the main topic of discussion today. But before we get to that, I just want to get your take um, on the reshuffling in cabinet that happened um, sometime last week, on Wednesday to be very precise. And I want to get your reaction, particularly with the appointment of Mr. Boisedi as the governor of the Central Bank and the appointment of Mr. Bakari Jami as the minister of trade. Bakari Jami is currently the governor of the Central Bank. Well, this has um, raised concerns among a lot of people that that process is not, is not right because it's unlawful. In other words, it's against the law. What's your reaction if you follow in developments? Well, I'm sure you know that uh, the National Assembly is a key stakeholder. So I'll just give mm -hmm. uh, the general perspective. But this is a matter that may uh, come to the Finance and Public Accounts Committee which presides over uh, the uh, Central Bank and uh, the Auditor General's Office and those institutions. What is important is that a president has prerogative to make appointments. But obviously, uh, before you appoint somebody, one would expect some form of consultation. Right. The appointment of the president is absolute when it comes to a minister. But the central bank is a different uh, institution. It's an institution that is responsible for the currency, issuing the currency of the country. It's the institution that will receive monies into the consolidated fund and ensure that as per law, uh, there are withdrawals from that consolidated fund. It is the institution that deals with insurance companies, banks. So essentially, it uh, manages the financial architecture of the state. So you would not want to disrupt such an institution because of certain political considerations. So I would consideration. Say, yes, mm -hmm. I would, I would uh, assume yeah. that uh, the debate will go on and probably it may reach the uh, annals of the uh, National Assembly. And uh, I'm sure there would be more consultation on the issue itself. So it is not okay. from a judge to determine what is right and wrong, but essentially the reason why the directors of the central bank are required to have that appointment confirmed by the Public Service Commission. So the intention is clear that it is the type of public service that would require independence in its operations. So freeing it from political grip would be the best way forward for the institution and should be the best way for the institution as we stand. Right. And we've not gotten um, any response so far from the office of the president or from the attorney general's office regarding this matter. 
So uh, we, we are trying to reach out to them to get their reaction to what is happening. But for Mr. Jame himself, he wrote a letter to the president and, 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 and you know, cited the, the act, and that is the Central Bank of the Gambia Act 2018, um, as, his res as the reasoning why he cannot take up the new appointment which is to become the Minister of Trade. And I want to quote uh, in his letter one of the reasons uh, that he gave. And as for Section 18 of the Central Bank Act 2018, the governor shall be appointed for a term of five years within which the position is not transferable. Subject to Section 18, Subsection 7, the governor may resign upon giving three months' notice in writing to the president before expiration of his or her term. Section 18, subsection 8, provides that the president may only remove the governor after appointing an independent tribunal to investigate and submit a report to the president subject to section 18, subsection 9. So clearly, unless otherwise um, proven by the executive, uh, Mr. Jamis seems to stand on a very strong footing of the law. Well, I think uh, Mr. Jamis is very generous in going into those details. Uh, there is nowhere that is indicated that uh, he has been actually uh, uh, removed from office of the central bank for some violation of either the Constitution or the Act. And he has also not resigned. What has been heard is that he has been appointed to a ministerial post. So in essence, uh, I am convinced that uh, the matter as uh, his consideration uh, will ultimately uh, come to the level of uh, the public ins the institutions of the state. And the National Assembly is one of those institutions. Um, I would believe that before it reaches that level, uh, the executive will inform itself uh, to make it. Okay, we, it, it looks like the, uh, the, the connection is not very, very strong there. I, I mean, yes, it, it's I, hard to hear. I, I'm emphasizing that uh, okay. Mr. Kwame is generous in the sense that he is going into the issues of resignation and removal from office. Okay. The fact so that he has neither resigned nor has he been removed from office for violation of the Constitution or the Central Bank Act. What, in essence, is in play is his appointment as a minister. And it is important that this matter be allowed uh, to reach its logical conclusion of the executive taking regard of the issues he has raised uh, in order to come to a decision uh, that is reasonable and justifiable under the constitution and the laws of the country. Right. Okay. So last, last, last question on this matter. Uh, I don't want us to spend much time on this because that's not the focus of this discussion. But just because we're just having this discussion, uh, the central bank governor is saying, well, uh, be moved move to another position as minister. I cannot because of this particular section of the law. Do you believe that in itself is healthy for our democratic process? Well, obviously the constitution is the supreme law and the president swears uh, to ensure that it is implemented without fear or favor, affection or ill will. And uh, obviously uh, you cannot do anything that undermines what constitutes legal procedure. That is why I am sure you must have uh, been aware uh, quite a, a lot of cases here and there uh, would actually uh, find, uh, its, uh, find their place in the, in the public domain only for one to uh, discover that maybe uh, there has been a lapse in this area or that area. So let's mm -hmm. take it as a matter that requires engagement between uh, the governor and the appointee of the governor and uh, where it becomes necessary i'm sure the the executive will get a legal advice from the attorney general who is the principal legal advisor of the government 
Uh, in fact, these are things that should happen prior to appointments to public office. To the appointment. That right. uh, is always important for such appointments to be premised uh, by consultation with uh, the principal legal advisor of the government. Maybe it has been done. Uh, I cannot really vouch for that. But what is important is that it's an issue in the public uh, space, and I'm sure there are many interested parties, even to the level of the National Assembly. Okay. All right, so let's move to the main topic of today, and that has to do with the draft new constitution. Um, as I said in the introduction, um, it has been rejected in the National Assembly, uh, which is unfortunate because many Gambians, we are looking forward to, to, to its being passed, at least moving forward, um, that second reading of the bill. But um, let me ask you first about the party position of the PDOIS. I know um, the PDOIS members in the National Assembly all voted um, in support of the bill. But is there a party position as far as this bill is concerned? Official party position? Well, we have always promoted the idea of separation of party and state. That is a golden rule for PDOIS. And that is why you see our members here and there in the National Assembly may take different uh, views on certain issues. Uh, what I am convinced is that all members of the party in the National Assembly uh, are convinced that the 2020 draft constitution is uh, a bit more superior uh, to the uh, content of the 1997 constitution, just as the 1997 constitution was superior to the content of the 1970 constitution. So we look at constitutions from a gradualist perspective or a perspective of total overhauling. Uh, I would say that when the CRC was being given its mandate under the Constitutional Review Commission's Act, uh, they were not charged with the responsibility of total overhaul. They were charged with the responsibility of reviewing 1997, uh, take from it what needs to be retained, remove from it what needs to be removed, and then take into consideration certain fundamental values of constitution making in a republic and have that as an input in the final draft of the provisions of the draft constitution. So, what Hold on, let, let, let me get this clear here, Honorable Salah. Are you saying that the act that established the Constitutional Review Commission did not ask for a complete overhaul of the 1997 Constitution. It talks about a review and to take on board consultation with the citizenry at home and abroad, and also to look at certain fundamental values in constitution making, the supremacy of the uh, Republic, the uh, supremacy of the sovereignty of the people, the supremacy of the Constitution, uh, electoral processes that will ensure that you have unalloyed uh, results in determining who should uh, uh, manage the affairs of the country in terms of governance. So essentially uh, looking at uh, issues of an open society where there'll be no restriction on any particular religion, but will promote a greater harmony of the citizenry. Uh, so many, many provisions uh, are in the act itself that should serve as a guide or have served as a guide to the CRC. So ultimately, it is the duty of the National Assembly members to review what they were charged to do and gauge whether they have achieved that or not. That was our task when the Constitution, draft constitution came to the fore. So do, would, would you go as far as um, make the claim that the CRC itself violated the act that established it? Well, you would not say a violation. When they say you do not overhaul, it does not mean that you retain every aspect of the 1997 constitution. Uh, they have provided a draft which incorporates uh, what was relevant in the 1997 constitution and continue to come up with new provisions uh, that they deemed uh, to add value to the constitutional process. So in other words, they did the review, but also incorporated um, that was new the, ideas. Okay. 
Right. So, okay. So now let's let's move on to the votes. Um, you were there. You observed. You participated. To your own understanding, what do you think was responsible uh, besides the arguments that were made by members of the National Assembly against the bill? Do you believe there were other reasons or other forces behind the, 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 their vote? Well, my honest opinion is that uh, the trajectory has departed from the logical conclusion that was drawn that led us to establish a coalition and change uh, Gambia's government. The original objective was very clear that uh, we will create a transitional administration that will be broad-based and that would incorporate consultation in determining all uh, the occupants of the institutions of the state and uh, fundamentally to engage in constitutional, institutional, and uh, changes in normative practices, both administrative and managerial, uh, that would ensure that there is civil service reform uh, uh, going to the area of security sector reform, moving into a reform of management uh, at the manage uh, management level and administration level, and move further afield to ensure that we create new institutions that will always be aligned to addressing the needs and aspirations of the people. Uh, I've been uh, reminding people of President Barrow's manifesto, and clearly those were the objectives. So, uh, essentially, what should have been done is... When, when you say President Barrow's manifesto, I... President Barrow as a president, or was this a, a coalition manifesto? This was the objective of, of, of the coalition. Yes, you know what we must always bear in mind is that we conceived the coalition and then had to abide by the law of the state by allowing him to be an independent candidate. And then by being an independent candidate, we supported him. And at that material time, is a coalition manifesto. But what people must always distinguish is this separation of the individual party and the state. You see, once the person is elected and becomes mm -hmm. the president of the republic, then it is left to that individual to see whether one is going to incorporate everything that was in the manifesto and to cooperate with a coalition in order to implement the fundamental objectives. I am saying that at the, at the first go in constituting cabinet, it took the direction of appeasing political parties. There is nothing wrong for political parties to promote that agenda to agree in order to form a coalition. But when it comes to running a government, you have to focus again on the coalition and the objectives of the coalition. And I must say that the second most important development after the election of the president was to create the independent institution that will preside over how the state manages the affairs of the people. And also the institution that will make the laws that will be implemented so that their operationalization will lead to the institutionalization of all the state structures. So clearly, uh, that element did not have the strategic thinking that was already embedded in the manifesto, that our duty was to ensure that there is constitutional, institutional reforms and change of mindset so that we give Gambia a new start. I think when we departed, uh, we lost track. And if you can remember, when they brought the bill to the National Assembly in 2017, I raised the question, what is the objective? If our objective is a three-year transition program, then the easiest way to achieve constitutional reform is to rely on Section 226, which provides for two provisions, one that deals with amendment by the National Assembly, and another that deals with amendment of the... 226 of the 1997 Constitution. Indeed. 
it provides for two provisions, amendment of the non-entering clauses by the National Assembly, which simply takes three months of publication, uh, not less than 10 days of the second publication, and then submission to the National Assembly for review. First reading, second reading, third reading, approved, and then it goes to the president for his assent, and that will be uh, the, the constitutional provision. It happened when there was intention to change the 65 years. You would remember that initially, at that material time, when they wanted to change it, the APRC constituted the majority in the National Assembly. I think you remember that. So they brought yes. the bill yeah. prior to publication, as required by the Constitution, the three months, 10 days. So consequently, myself and many a number of, of people, including uh, the uh, former Attorney General, saw that they had not been compliant with the publication dimension for three months, 10 days. I guess it's the internet connection in Banjul, but it's... Uh in three months, 10 days. And as a result, they had to remove that. Even though the APRC parliament, they had the majority, they approved it. And uh, it is only at the level of the president accepting to it that the attorney general advised the president uh, that they had not complied with proper procedures and therefore that uh, uh, bill should not be accepted to become law. So they had to bring it again to the National Assembly at a time when the coalition was already uh, a, the majority in the National Assembly, and consequently, uh, that bill also passed, and the 65 years uh, was sent uh, to, uh, let's call it the gallows. It, it was hanged. It was yeah. no longer there. Yeah. So, uh, essentially, right. I, 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 done that. and it will only take yeah. three months, 10 days, and the review by the National Assembly, and maybe within a period of six months, you would have had all those provisions changed. Now, for the, for the entrance yeah. clauses, uh, the uh, constitutional provision is saying that when it is published for uh, three months and then 10 days and brought to the National Assembly, first reading, second reading, three quarter majority, uh, third reading, three quarter majority, uh, then uh, when that happened, uh, you do not pass it and send it to the president for his assent. It is submitted to independent electoral commission and the independent electoral commission must hold a referendum within uh, six months and when that's done then and to, to for that to pass during a referendum 50 percent of the population who are voters must vote and 75 percent must approve those who voted must approve then it is approved and automatically it comes to the national assembly automatically sent to the president for his assent. Within seven days, he must assent to it to become law. Okay. That is the process. It should yeah, I, 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 I asked that, that question to, um, I put that question to the chairman of the, uh, the Constitutional Review Commission when they were doing their consultations. And they had a meeting in Atlanta. And I, I, I went there to attend that meeting and had an interview with him uh, and one of the commission members, Mr. Gay So, and I asked that particular question, why? What was necessary for us to go for a whole new constitution when we had the 1997 constitution that could have been amended? Because constitutions are made to last forever. Uh, but the only answer they gave me was that um, at the national conference, consultation, uh, consultative conference in Banjul that gave rise to the Constitutional Review Commission, um, was that the 1997 Constitution, um, using his word uh, exactly, was butchered more than 50 times. And at that, at that conference, um, that's where they decided that um, you know, the country should go for a whole new constitution. Now, here where we are right now, that new constitution is... Uh, rejected by the National Assembly. In your own understanding of how things work in the National Assembly, do you think this bill, um, with the way it looks right now, has a way of coming back to the National Assembly? And do you think members of the National Assembly will be able to vote for it one more time? I think you've heard my views during the adjournment debate. Uh, the question you asked the Constitutional Review Commission could not be answered by them and it was not their prerogative to answer. There was the mood in the country, in cabinet and in parliament, 
for overhauling the 1997 constitution in order to come up with a tax republic. That was the agenda from the level of the executive, from the level of the National Assembly at the time. Look at who were the members of cabinet and what they propagated. That was the spirit of coming up with a tax republic and you cannot come up with a tax republic without a tax republican constitution. For me, I had no disagreement if that is what uh, the, the, the consensus was, because what mm -hmm. I'm interested in is a better constitution. But seeing the three year time frame at the moment, at that moment, I was convinced that that was not doable <laughs> within three years. And that's why I was making them to, to look uh, at uh, what we are approving. And, and essentially, uh, what was seen to is that uh, finally, when we bring that uh, uh, bill to the National Assembly, we'll be having a consolidated bill. Bill that has provisions which could be amended by National Assembly members and provisions that could only be amended through a referendum. So when you have this bill all incorporated in one bill, so what do you do under those circumstances? Where will you rely to promulgate it. That is really the challenge that the National Assembly confronted initially. And uh, we were looking for possibilities of a solution. And if you look at uh, uh, section 226 of section nine, it does talk about what alteration of the constitution means, the enactment of the constitution, modification, repeal, all these are defined there under section 226 uh, subsection nine. But then what it does not state in section 226 is, if you want to promulgate a new constitution, what provisions under section 226 are you going to rely on to do the promulgation? If you're going to repeal it, what provision are you going to rely on in terms of procedure to be able to repeal it? So we exercise uh, through diligence to, to see that, well, if we spend all this money to have this constitution, then maybe we can find ways and means of, of, of getting it through. And, and that's why, if you can remember, I put a section 102, which says that uh, you can present a bill and then in the bill uh, make uh, uh, that proposition for it to go to a referendum, which means already it is, it is clear that the entry clauses must go to a referendum. And if we decide to uh, forget, forgo our own rights as national assembly members to, to uh, move into uh, approving what we could approve, then we could move towards uh, a referendum. But uh, what was very clear that maybe was not clear in the eyes of maybe even national assembly members is that the first phase when the bill is before the national assembly is simply the first reading to introduce it. The second reading is when you discuss the merit and objects. Should we really have a new constitution when we want a third republic? That should not have really created any form of, 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 of divergence views, if you look at it. Because everybody knows that we merit a better constitution that we now have. So we, after the debate and exhaustive uh, analysis, we could have gone with the three-quarter majority to pass, to, to move to the third reading. Second right. But, you know, we could have moved from the second reading to move towards the third reading. And how do you move towards the third reading? Listen carefully. Once the second reading has the three-quarter majority, that bill is referred to a committee of the National Assembly or committees of the National Assembly or committee of the whole assembly. And of course, a bill dealing with constitution would have been referred to the committee of the whole assembly. And on our standing or the standing order 69, when a bill comes to a whole assembly, the assembly is to look not at its merits, it is to look at its details. We could have considered to that. And you see, when you are examining the details, you can bring subject matter specialists. The whole CRC could have been there as subject matter specialists to answer every question because the bill has to be considered clause by clause. Mm -hmm. So Suleiman, clearly it was in the national interest because even at the third reading, 
you can reject it. So no, why not allow at that time for the bill to go through the stage of committee so that all the doubts of the members will actually be evaluated and weighed and clause by clause with the whole nation listing it. This would have been the most important productive exercise that a nation could have ever been engaged in nation building and constitution building. Everybody would have understood the details. And then from the details, you can now form your opinion. But people yeah. started forming opinion without even the evaluation of the details. Some were talking about lawyers advising them who are those lawyers. Those lawyers could have been brought as subject matter specialists. If right. you don't trust the CRC, you don't trust, you recommend for those lawyers to come. But we did not go through that stage. And therefore, even though the majority accepted, but because we did not have three court majority, the minority were able to derail the process. But as you ask, yes, there are so many uh, uh, mechanisms in the standing orders and constitution that, that enables you to, to look at things and, and see whether I, I raised that issue with the Attorney General and the uh, Vice President, whether uh, they have departed from the agenda of a tight republic, because they cannot have a tight republic without a tight republican constitution. Are they willing to reconsider? They mm -hmm. say, well, cabinet will meet, and then they'll come back to us. That's how matters stand. Well, I, 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 yeah, I asked the um, same question to the Honorable uh, Attorney General Minister of Justice when I had him on the program last week. I asked him that question. And um, from all indications, they are ready to reconsider. In fact, um, according to him, they have started um, consultations with various stakeholders. I'm not sure if, uh, if they have reached out to you or to, the, to your party, but have you had any consultations between and amongst other um, stakeholders like other political parties, civil society organizations? Have you had any consultations so far uh, with any of those stakeholders since the rejection of the bill in the National Assembly? I really believe that the task now is to explain the text of the Constitution to the population at large so that uh, all National Assembly members will have to explain to their constituency uh, the position they took. And uh, obviously, uh, when everything is clear to all, all will see the need for that input of looking at what mechanism we are going to uh, adopt so that at least the bill will go to the committee of the whole house and clause by clause, we will all ask our questions. And if they are doubting Thomas's and things are clear, then many things could be clarified. So I would say that engagement is, is, is on all across the board and we can envisage a possibility of finding a way because no one can say they have found a way of how to bring it back because this matter mm -hmm. is a matter of the National Assembly, no longer a matter really uh, of uh, uh, anybody else. So it must collaborate with the executive and it is the National Assembly that can allow it to pass or derail it. So, uh, everybody now uh, would focus on the National Assembly members and some may have inadvertently uh, done something because they did not understand what was there. So people like me and, and others are trying as much as possible to be in the media and try to look at these clauses and uh, clauses that appeared to have uh, uh, been unacceptable to some. Maybe if we look at it from another direction, it will become acceptable. That is the debate that should continue. Open minds, right? Cross by cross. Yeah. Right. But do you have? Do you have you been approached, or have you approached other stakeholders um, in, in having consultations with them on this bill? Because uh, from the minister, uh, and listening to the press conference that the chairperson of the CRC, uh, Justice Jallo, uh, did some, some a couple of days ago, they all seem to be hopeful that this thing is not dead. Uh, it could be brought back, to, brought back to life. In that regard, it cannot happen uh, without members of the National Assembly, as you, uh, as, you self, uh, as you admitted right there. So have you started consultations with other stakeholders? Well, you know, you don't answer those questions in the affirmative. But I must say that there is real engagement nationally 
And uh, there is hope that uh, all is not lost. That I can affirm. But there is hope that all is not lost because the mechanisms are there. The, the, the roadmap is there. Uh, all we need is to search for it. And uh, I'm confident that we'll find a, a way out. Okay. Yeah. So that brought me to the next question, which has to do with the National Assembly itself as an institution. Because members who serve in the National Assembly are serving people. They are the representatives of the people. The capacity to understand and the importance that needs to be attached to documents such as the Constitution is paramount. Do you believe in your dealings with members of the National Assembly? And this is not personal. This has nothing to do with personal. We just want to build a strong institution like the National Assembly to be able to exercise its oversight responsibility over the executive. Do you believe the capacity exists in our National Assembly currently that can do that job? The agenda, uh, Mr. Davo, was to give Gambia a new start. And the National Assembly was crucial as an institution fully responsible uh, to legislate. And you cannot have any development without legislation. The idea was the mindset. The mindset which enabled us to elect Barrow as an independent candidate should have been the same mindset of electing National Assembly members so that they can accompany the process of constitutional and institutional reform in order to achieve the fundamental aim of the coalition of giving Gambia a level ground for multi-party contests where all the institutions would have been in place and any new stakeholders in the political domain would have found all the structures, all the instruments available to have a good start. That was the objective. So that was not what led people into the National Assembly elections. It was competition as to who will win the largest number of seats. And consequently, you have to look at people who are popular in particular areas, and maybe by selecting them, uh, you will be able to get a seat. So we even want... even when those people lack the capacity, well, I will not to judge... become members of the national assembly. I will not judge them by that. So that you have to put to, to the political parties and independent uh, people who stood. I am simply saying that the original agenda, as per my own thinking, was to have independent national assembly members fundamentally ready to implement the objectives of the coalition. And that's why I went to the National Assembly so that some of us who had little experience will be able to share with them and that's precisely what we are doing so that we build up the capacity to achieve. Look at it, it's not always uh, that National Assembly members take partisan line. There was this women's uh, uh, enterprise uh, fund. Uh, unanimously, uh, we viewed it at the consideration stage, we almost changed it 100% in consultation with the minister. But eventually we agreed and it had a smooth sail at the level of the National Assembly. This is what parliament is supposed to be. But some crucial decisions tend to take uh, uh, another dimension, which is not in the best interest of the country. But you are better judging. Yeah, yeah. I, I asked that question because many people don't understand the reasoning um, behind the decision to vote no uh, by some members of the National Assembly. Again, it is, it is understandable. It is not possible to have, um, it is almost impossible uh, to have all members of the National Assembly agree on a particular issue or on a document such as the um, Constitution. But the arguments that we've had from members of the National Assembly on the floor against this bill raise the question, do we have the right people in the National Assembly to do the job of the National Assembly? We were supposed to look at the merits, and not the details. And therefore, uh, uh, what happened does happen. So they have power to speak, freedom of expression in the National Assembly. Nobody can stop them from speaking their minds. But essentially, what was interrogated regarding 
the details should have come at the committee level. That's what I'm telling you. It is more appropriate for that to come to the, uh, at the committee level, and therefore the subject matter specialist would have been there. If somebody has advised you and is willing to appear before the National Assembly, the person could have been invited. So it means that all sectors of society would have been there, present, listening to the interrogation that the National Assembly members will make on each of the clauses that now uh, constitute the draft constitution uh, that has been thrown away. So in, uh, we, it, you must see it as a lost opportunity because at the third reading, you can see rejected. Mm -hmm. So why not allow it to pass and deal with the nitty gritty and then eventually you, you make up your mind. Nobody, as you said, uh, you cannot force everybody to agree with, with something. But we must also bear in mind that under many, many uh, circumstances, National Assembly members have been able to vote unanimously for, for certain bills. So the, the, the capacity is there to, to agree in total, uh, but the capacity is also there for divergent views and uh, divergent uh, voting patterns. Okay, now let's move on to what we can do from here. Again, I don't want to take much time um, on what, uh, what's lost already. How can we revive the, 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 the document? Because I think it is very important that people realize how important this document is. It contains most of the fundamental values um, that most democratic societies would aspire for uh, are contained in this document. So it should be very clear to people that it is important that we have this document uh, as our national document. <laughs> in doing that, I want to know if you have any reservations yourself particularly, um, or your party has any reservations about any clause, about any provision in the 2020 draft new constitution that you have raised uh, an alarm on. You see, two things. Uh, number one is the very issue that you have raised, that this constitution uh, has all the elements that any democratic society would yearn for. In fact, that is one of the reasons why some people have advanced that even uh, man marrying man, woman marrying woman, is actually in the constitution uh, mm -hmm. because of the way we, we frame positions. Uh, essentially, uh, that's why the detailed analysis, yes, we have many things that, that we, we would want to be better. And uh, we will be coming up with it. I'm sure we'll be able to get an engagement in terms of like clause by clause review of what we believe uh, could, 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 could be improved. But essentially, uh, let us land on this particular point that we must be careful of generalization. That's why looking at the details becomes very important. And uh, many people have been referring to uh, Clause 54 and indicating that it allows a male and male to marry and female and female to marry. And you look at that provision and you see that in the 1997 Constitution, it is under Section 27, which is still in the Constitution. We say that men and women have a right to marry based on consent. Right. So it is, it is still there, men and women. Mm -hmm. Now, under the draft 54, it says a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. And you see the, the CRC incorporated what was in the 1997 constitution in its first draft. And there was a boomerang of, of, of mm -hmm. condemnation yeah. that aims to, to, to bring uh, this uh, same-sex marriages. Now, it decided in its uh, second draft to make it a man and a woman, so that this is incapable of misinterpretation. After right. a man and a woman, it says such marriage, has a right to marry, and it says such marriage. So which marriage? Is the marriage of the man and the woman. And mm -hmm. then, so th that marriage must be based on uh, consent, etc. looking at the details. So it means that nobody can force the person to get married. But here it 
makes it singular, a man and a woman, and such marriage referring to the man and the woman, and the marriage, and still people at the National Assembly, National Assembly members, said that some lawyer had advised them that this uh, could be misinterpreted to, to allow a marriage between a ma <laughs> man and man. So this, these are the problems that we must begin to address. I don't want to go into the details of the mind of the National Assembly members, but I can say 90% of those who disagreed what they said, I disagree with their position. And I have said it everywhere that I'm willing to engage them one-on-one -on, -one on their position so that we look at. Because what I have seen is that either the new provision is more advanced or it's a replica of the old. So if you reject it, you stay. What you've criticized is what you learn into again under the 1997 constitution, which means that you must do a contrast between the two constitutions to really understand the value of the change that, 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 that they tried to uh, input in the draft constitution. Right. Well, I ask this question because I believe that um, this should take a, a, a form of a national consultation between and amongst our national leaders, uh, including uh, members of, uh, of, of the general public and civil society organizations. Because constitutional making is not an easy process, and it, is just, it just don't happen like that. It is a hard process to go through. But as a nation, as leaders, I believe that um, our political leaders and our national leaders should be able to come together in a room and discuss and compromise amongst themselves to let this document not die. That is the essence of democracy. It is not possible to satisfy every individual group or society. But that's why you have negotiations. So my question is, will you be able, ready to participate in a discussion, in a national discussion, where compromise can be reached to have this document revive itself again? Well, I think you know our position. So our position is uh, the document is... is is better than the 1997 constitution. So we are not the one to consult. We support uh, the document. Mm -hmm. uh, what we can do is to consult with others. And but you are a stakeholder still. Yeah. You are still a stakeholder. I'm just saying that we can consult with others and hear their view. And I'm advising that we do this more in the public space initially, so that clause by clause will be understood by the Gambian people so that one do not rely on promoting an agenda to uh, maybe not telling what it is uh, to your constituency. So I believe that what we need more than anything else now is this type of engagement with your media and all the other media establishments so that we look at all those points that were raised by the National Assembly members as the basis of their opposition to see whether they stand the test of, 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 of uh, analysis and whether that will be convincing enough to them so that we go to the next stage. The next stage, I am sure, will have to be moved by the executive and the National Assembly so as to know exactly what uh, provisions of the standing orders and what provisions of the Constitution we are going to rely on to have a second try. I, I'm, I can assure you that, that that engagement is on. Okay. And because this is a matter of urgency, uh, elections are supposed to happen in the year 2021. We only have a couple of months before that. Now, a lot of things need to be done, not only this constitution, but the IEC, that is the Independent Electoral Commission, has work to do. Registration of voters needs to be done. All these things need to be done before we can have elections. So the time is not on our side. And not only that, the country also needs to move forward. The country has continued to have every need of development. Every sector of development is needed in that country right now. So constitution right now should be a thing of the past. We should have moved past that stage now. Unfortunately, here we are. Uh, we still have to deal with the constitution, and we have all these development agendas out there that we need to address, and it's not happening. So this becomes a matter of urgency for our national leaders to come together and hammer out a way. It is urgent as far as the draft constitution is concerned. 
but know that we already have a constitution, the 1997 constitution. And if there is no immediate consultation to see how we are going to move forward, uh, the IEC is going to rely on the 1997 constitution to carry on all those things that you have mentioned because they cannot violate the constitution. So that is what people must bear in mind that constitution must exist. Either a new constitution after a referendum or a 1997 constitution. There is no middle road. So in actual fact, uh, the slower we become, the likeliness is that all institutions will continue uh, to uh, calibrate their, their calendar and agenda on the basis of the 1997 constitution, which I am sure those who oppose the, the change, uh, if they really reflect again, uh, I think uh, uh, it may not be in their enlightened interest, but I think in our discussion, we'll be able to reflect on that. Uh, so, so honorable, uh, I'm so, sorry about that uh, interruption there. But I was, I, I was talking about the urgency of, of the matter at hand, that um, our national leaders should be able to come together in a room and compromise on this document to let it not die, because it is such an important document. Uh, and that if you look at it too, that's the essence of democracy. You can't satisfy every individual group or society, but that's when you have a compromise. Mm -hmm. So are you ready to be in that kind of uh, dialogue setting where, you know, uh, the leaders, you know, you included to, to discuss compromise on this. Any dialogue must be supported, and I support any dialogue. But I'm focusing your mind on the issue that the National Assembly members would have the opportunity to look at the bill clause by clause. So what is most significant now is how to get it back to the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. And there are avenues, but you do not start talking about them it's like you are directing what people should do. I think you understand what I'm saying. But if we have yes, to I do. sit down, then we'll be able to reflect together. So when you come out, it appears like a, a common notion and a common view. But uh, clearly, mm -hmm. I understand the standing orders. I know exactly which uh, standing order to rely on uh, to uh, try to bring back a, a new process. Right. So... Let, let, let's, we, um, we are ready for any form of dialogue to, to, to achieve that. Mm -hmm. But it's more the national assembly members. Let's see that this thing the executive uh, would uh, uh, bring, but ultimately it's the national assembly members that's more ready, that must be ready to move forward. Right. And the, the Honorable Attorney General said in, our, in my discussion with him that uh, he thinks the executive itself should not lead the process of dialogue. Because just because um, the way it's been criticized in so many quarters, so it, it, it wants to absorb itself of the responsibility and let uh, an independent individual organization come forward to lead the process of consultation between and among um, various stakeholders. Um, and I think that would be a welcome um, idea by many stakeholders just because this, the executive at this point in time seem to be um, you know compromised if you want to use that word but you know not not on a very strong footing to lead the discussions it, it, itself so I think the issue of having an independent body or an individual to lead the process of consultations and negotiations between the various state, state, um, stakeholders is, is important we are ready okay. we are ready uh, so for people like you, for people like you, Honorable Salah, um, it is unfortunate um, that um, we, we've learned from you that you won't be contesting the next um, parliamentary elections to become a member of the National Assembly. And it is because of issues like this, the, the problem of having the right people in the National Assembly who understand, um, and again, I understand your position that you don't want to incent yourself in the National Assembly for that too long, but we need experienced people like yourself in the National Assembly. And that puts, uh, brings in the question of capacity building the National Assembly. Fundamental. Do you think, yes, do you believe that the general public 
who vote for members of the National Assembly need to critically vet people who become, um, who come before them to seek their votes to become members of the National Assembly because it is becoming increasingly an important institution in the Gambia. Well, it's a very significant institution that was neglected in the past with immense powers that was also ignored in the past. And I think you see how we are exercising those powers in the selection of ombudsman, etc. So the powers are there and they can be enhanced. And those powers are, are designed to ensure that you have a governance environment that is responsive to the needs of the people. Uh, it is going to be very crucial uh, as we move forward that many people who have not offered themselves uh, to be National Assembly members would now be offering themselves as National Assembly members uh, because of what is currently happening. Uh, I don't think we can continue to point accusing fingers when people who deem it uh, uh, appropriate for them uh, to be present there, to be able to add value, uh, uh, shy away. So uh, I think uh, many lessons are being learned that uh, the electorate must look beyond uh, just uh, some form of uh, popularity to select a person. Uh, competence will increasingly become very important. I was just telling some people uh, some days ago that, well, you know, I move about in Serekunda and look at the potholes and everywhere. I see that, well, uh, you know, this shows you that uh, people are yet to understand that councils are the ones who take revenue and the central government is the institution that takes revenue to be able to bring about development. But the National Assembly members are there to carry out oversight, to ensure that accountability prevails, to ensure that the laws are made that are fit for purpose. So in essence, uh, if like myself, I go into National Assembly, I think I have done everything that needs to be done. We are going to leave a record behind that people can rely on. Uh, capacity building is taking place and uh, then uh, we must move and address something else. That is uh, the key development issues. How do you build roads? How do you build hospitals, schools, provide jobs to ensure that the people live decent lives? Uh, those are executive issues. They are uh, local government issues. So it is important that people begin to focus on both institutions. The institutions that are given responsibility to accumulate the wealth of society and utilize it for our development and the institution that should carry out oversight. I think once we have that right, we're going to have good governance. And that is your next move. That is to move to the executive level, which is to vie for the presidency of the Gambia. Um, I, I want to ask this question uh, because I think you have um, heard or read some uh, comments from some political commentators in the Gambia and across the globe that, um, that, that argues that uh, most opposition um, leaders in, 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 in the Gambia, I just want to use the Gambia, but you know, generally speaking, the African continent, that they, they, they stay in power for too long. And that gives you give someone the um, assumption that when they occupy, eventually become um, presidents, uh, they will stay in power that much. How would you react to that? I know you, uh, you, um, you are leading the uh, the, the, the DOI party and um, Hussein Dabo is leading the UDP party. He has been the leader of the United Democratic Party for 24 years. Um, you has been the leader of PDOIs for quite a while now. How would you react to such arguments? Well, briefly, we, you, I think you know that DOI does not have a leader. We have a leadership. And you know that even though I was Secretary General, it was Siri Ajata who stood uh, in previous elections. And I believe you also know that uh, we, I was selected to be a DOI candidate in the 2016 elections. But I believe I stepped down for uh, Adam Obama, who is now president. So essentially, uh, we do not talk about self-perpetuated rule and you link it to DOI because we've always been building coalition 2011 and allow others to lead. So the issue now before us is at the latter part of our own political contribution, do we shy away because of such comments? Or do we proceed to put an end 
to precisely what led us to come to the fore in the first place, put an end to the poverty of this land. So every time you talk about the Halifa Sala Sidi Jata, well, tell us the next person who has that great aspiration and dedication ready to eradicate the poverty of our country and build up this, the system that requires to put an end to self perpetuating rule. We subscribe to the two term limit. In 2016, when I became a presidential candidate, go back to my statement. I said that at that material time, in two years, I will be 65. So I will accept to serve a two year term and work to change the constitution. But even in that change, I will not benefit from that change. That's what I said. I have said also, look at my, 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 my program, that there must be a separation of power between the state and party. And once elected, you must resign from all party posts. That is a joint agenda. But I don't want to use your forum. We are not no, very it's aspiring. very well. You are very much welcome to go ahead and, and explain no, the no, It is no, important no, for our for, for civil right, for, for people to understand. Agenda. We are saying that we must separate party and state. And you can read it in my program. That that would mean that once the person is elected, one must resign from all party posts and know that you are there for the state. I've emphasized what is now in fact in the draft constitution that any- but let, me, let, me push, let, let, let me push back on that uh, a little bit. If, if you are going to, if you are elected, for example, on a PDOIS ticket and you become president and now you have to separate yourself from PDOIS to, to focus just on state, before that, you are vying on a PDOIS um, ticket and also using PDOIS ideas and ideologies to advance or to, 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 to seek the vote of, uh, of the Gambian people. So you, I, I don't see how you separate these two because I, you have an agenda, which is a PDOIS agenda, that you have sold to the Gambian people. That's the whole, that's the You're whole, shaking your head. You don't agree with that. There's the whole confusion about democracy. And we've been helping people to understand, but they are indicting us. We are saying that once you are there as a head of state, you are working under a constitution. Those program will only serve you if you take them on board so that they can be translated into policies, into programs, into projects. And okay. there, when people can see doing ideology is, uh, is not something that is uh, high in the sky there. Uh, ideas must be concretized into policies, into programs, into projects, yes. in order to be able to address the needs and aspirations of the people. So if you are DOI, DOI has its agenda of how it, in terms of eradicate poverty, for example, we are yes. saying, how can you remove the youth from poverty under the current Gambian situation? You go and train them and train them and train them. At the end of the training, they do not own any form of means of production. People will come and go to Kafuta, etc. You give them all the land and the women will start cultivating for those women, for those, for those uh, owners, and they live in poverty and the wealth move away. We are saying that we do the land belongs to the people and never again Will anybody come and take the land from the people? Either it is an investment where you put money, their own land, and you have shareholding, but it will never go beyond that. We are saying that we must have a cooperative banking system where the people will be able to gain the resources needed without interest, but just service charges, so that they will be able to cultivate their land and engage in such a way that their earning capacity will increase. The same thing with gardening. We have emphasized that the linkage, GGTI, people are graduating. How many of them? We are importing almost four million, four billion dollars in water of rice. And we can cultivate it in the Gambia. Helping those people to have money from the cooperative system, cooperative banks, to be able to produce in abundance. Fertilizer seed farming implements of quality. 
And then what they can do is link that to milling machines, appropriate technology, where those people at GTTI all over the country can become the new appropriate uh, technology maintainers. Where and that would be machines, they'll be able to turn that cools into flour, rice, millet, and bag yeah. it. So you are linking yeah. both production at the raw material level and its processing. And look right. at thousands of women that are selling in the markets. So that would be that would be the agenda of a PDI. So you can link those, those, those right. producing so, the rice yeah. to those selling it so that they also become marketeers. And then you have a whole system. We are saying that we have a system in place. Right. That's right. Yeah. Eradicate poverty and get the people working. We can. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess the confusion is still is that then how would you be able to separate yourself as president from that agenda if that's the agenda you sold to the people? We are saying the agenda is translated into a policy of government. Right. And those who are part of the government will be promoting that agenda. You will, let's give you, let, let me give you an example. When we, when we took over the country, my first recommendation to President Barrow was for us to establish an agency for sustainable socioeconomic development. And it would be an expert bank. And at that time, many people were sending their curriculum video. And we could have created a database for all those people. And then when we start to look at each area of development, you combine those people to put their ideas together, and then you come up with the type of policies and the type of strategic plans that will be fit for purpose. That was the recommendation because this was a coalition government. Well, currently, you know, DOI has supporters, members, all over the place with their PhDs with, in all terrains who constitute the expert bank of, 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 of DOI with anybody else, as we said, when you move into the state level, that you no longer talk about DOI alone. You're talking about a nation. So the very expert bank that I recommended to, to, to President Barrow is the type of expert bank that you should create as a head of state. And through that, you'll be able to tap all the capacities of a nation and use it for the development of a nation. Because a nation is never developed without relying on the collective intelligence of the citizen. That is what we are saying. Right. OK. Well, uh, we'll have to bring this, con uh, this conversation to a conclusion. But before I do, you raised the issue of President Barrow. You were very close. In fact, you were his spokesperson. Um, knowing what you know about him as an individual, Describe to our viewers or our listeners what a kind of person do you think he is? What you must bear in mind is that when we met and established the coalition, I was the spokesperson of the coalition. And automatically they wanted me to be the spokesperson of President Bao. I said, no, he's not the presidential candidate. Let him select his own spokesperson. And he turned and selected me. That is good thing. So therefore, my responsibility was to ensure that as long as I was there, that my responsibility would be not to fail his trust. And I must say that as a person, the distance and accept his innocence and is always willing to learn. And some people see that as naivety. But when he learns and assimilates the knowledge, he take it as his own. And that is the personality. So I must say that we had a working relation because I had no ambition. I've not requested anything from him. And I think because of that, he respects me. Yeah. I, I, the reason why I ask that question is, um, is, is he, yeah, 
the reason why I ask that question is because he is unlike you. He's unlike uh, the the um, honorable senator Dab of the UDP. He's unlike my party. Uh, you people have been in the political scene for a while, and people have known you. You have interactions with people before. Uh, for President Barrow, no, it didn't happen that way. Even though he was in politics with the UDP, but he was not somebody who was out there that people, um, you know, were listening to, people come to know about. Um, so he came because of the coalition. That's the reason why uh, many people don't know his personality, what he believes, what he doesn't believe. So a lot of people question sometimes when he takes or makes certain decisions, they question then how does he think, uh, especially with the issue of um, the appointment of the central bank government that we started the discussion with? So that's why I asked the question, what kind of person do you think? But I'm glad that you mentioned the issue of that he listens and he said to learn and he's ready to accept. Uh, I, broke, I didn't hear the last word. Did you say? No, I, 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 I said uh, that's the reason why people do ask the question, um, what kind of personality do, does he have? Yeah. So it's important to hear from someone like you who worked with him closely to know um, what a kind of person he is. Well, I think it's very clear. I have told you that uh, when yeah. he asks the yeah. he listens. When he believes that you know, he will listen to you. And eventually, he takes his own uh, position once uh, he believes that he has all the information he needs. Uh, you can see how uh, uh, vice presidents were being uh, appointed. Uh, those are his views. Uh, so in, in essence, he has his own personal positions. And I think the mistake that people make is to believe that you can be an advisor of a president uh, to a point that you can dictate to him. That is the greatest uh, folly that anybody should entertain in one's mind. Mm -hmm. that once you occupy the position of the executive, you are a very powerful person. And anybody who is around you should always try to give you the best of information, but never, never believe that you can dictate to that person. Okay. Well, Honorable Halifa Salah, we thank you so much uh, for joining us today on Mamos Media. What I would say before letting you go is that we will be disappointed. And I'm saying we, as Gambian people, will be disappointed uh, in our national leaders if they cannot come together to have a compromise on this very important national document that is the draft new constitution. Because again, as I said, it has, there can be a compromise that's the essence of democracy. It cannot satisfy every individual group or society. But at least people can come together and agree on something by giving up on something to have something done or achieved. We thank you so much for coming on board today. This is a dialogue that we have started with the Attorney General and Minister of Justice. We have you today. We have some positive response from the leader of the United Democratic Party uh, through his spokesperson that he might be joining us uh, for our next discussion. So we'll continue our, to play our own part and uh, we, will, we, will, we will look forward to what you guys will be doing in the coming days or weeks or months perhaps. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, you want to say something? Collective punishment and collective guilt. This is the time to ensure that you judge people by their words and actions. So I don't want anybody to judge Halifa Salah on the basis of the actions and words of others. Judge me mm -hmm. by my words and actions. And right. I will accept my right. guilt if I'm indeed guilty. But I believe okay. that history will absolve me because throughout, from mm -hmm. day one of the coalition, helping the whole architecture to be built until we have different committees. All this we have, we have blueprints prepared and the committees just went and implemented them. So everything was there. And how we should have even reached this phase was there. But obviously, when you go into partisan politics, you cannot criticize anybody because it's interest. Partisan politics is interest. And who are you to tell people, let them not pursue their interest? So we had a goal to put partisan politics aside. We did not achieve that. And thereafter, now what you have is partisan politics. 
and instead of yeah. blaming them, let's accept the reality that you have an executive that has gone to the level of even having a party, and that's what he wills. And the others, that's what they will. So now, what do we make of this architecture? Instead of trying to patch it up, let's accept reality. Whatever we gain afterwards, know that it's a byproduct of the patchwork that we have actually mm -hmm. as a nation. And you, the people, yeah must begin to avoid that patchwork in your mind. Change your mindset. Join people by their words and deeds and pursue and support those you believe are ready to work in your enlightened interests. Right. Thank you so much, Honorable Halifa Salah. We will continue this discussion next time and we appreciate you coming on board. We will always be knocking on your door to have you uh, on the program. Thank you again. Thank you. Again, I am Suleiman Dabo. This is the Road to 2021. Until I come your way next week, have a great weekend.